Section 26 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13. War and Peace. The Palmerston Ministry, 1855 to 1857, Part 2. The definitive peace signed at Paris on March 30th, 1856, contained all we had any right to demand. Number one, the sublime port was formally admitted on the invitation of the six powers, including the King of Sardinia, to participate in the public law and concert of Europe, and the powers engaged severally to respect and collectively to guarantee the independence and the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire. Article 7. Number 2. The Sultan, in his constant solicitude for the welfare of his subjects, announced to the powers his intention to ameliorate their condition without distinction of creed or race. But the powers, while recognizing the high value of this communication, expressly repudiated the right to interfere either collectively or separately in the internal affairs of Turkey, Article 9. Number 3. The Black Sea was neutralized, its waters and forts were to be open to the mercantile marine of every nation, but permanently interdicted to the flag of war, and there were to be no arsenals, either Russian or Turkish, on its coasts, Articles 11, 12, 13, 14, and Attached Convention. Number 4. Kars was to be restored to the Turks, and the Crimea to Russia, Article 4. Number 5. The navigation of the Danube was to be free, and Russia was to retire from its shores by ceding a strip of Bessarabia to Moldavia. Articles 15 through 21. Number 6. The principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia were to remain under the suzerainty of the port. Russia renounced her exclusive protectorate over them, and the contracting powers collectively guaranteed their privileges. Articles 22 through Articles 27. And number 7. The liberties of Servia were to be similarly guaranteed. Articles 28 and Articles 29. By an addendum to the treaty known as the Declaration of Paris, it was agreed to abolish privateering and to proclaim as permanently accepted principles of maritime war the concessions to neutrals made during the recent war by England and France, Number one, a neutral flag was to cover an enemy's goods except contraband of war. Number two, neutral merchandise except contraband was not to be seized under an enemy's flag. And number three, a blockade was to be effective, that is, maintained by an adequate naval force. Such were the terms of the treaty which crowned the conclusion of the Crimean War. That war had cost England nearly 23,000 men and nearly 80 million pounds. What had it achieved? The claim of Russia to an exclusive protectorate over Turkey or any part of it was definitely abandoned. Her ships of war were driven from the Black Sea. Her arsenals were no longer to dominate its coasts, and she herself was to retire from the shores of the Danube that these terms were highly advantageous to the sultan is indisputable. Were they equally advantageous to his Christian subjects or to the Western powers who had thrust back his hereditary foe? The neutralization of the Black Sea was a clear, though temporary, gain to the Mediterranean powers in general, and perhaps in particular to Great Britain. But repulsed at the Bosphorus, Russia tried to force her way on to the Persian Gulf headed off again by Great Britain from the Persian Gulf, she was driven still further east. Whether to our ultimate advantage, it is difficult to say. From a selfish point of view, England had better, perhaps, have accepted the suggestions made by the Tsar Nicholas to Sir Hamilton Seymour, though captious critics of English policy will hardly fail to observe that England is today in possession of Egypt and Cyprus, while Russia is no nearer to Constantinople than she was in 1853. 
France gained little from the war, but Napoleon gained much. In 1853 his position in France was far from assured. The Crimean War established it, and until the advent of Bismarck, his influence upon the continent was almost overwhelming. The war gained him paradoxically the friendship of Russia. The peace lost him the confidence of England. The greatest gainer by the war, excepting the port, was Italy. Cavour, despite the angry protest of Austria, took his seat at the council board in Paris as the representative not merely of Sardinia, but of Italy. In the name of Italy, he denounced the misgovernment of the two Sicilies, and for Italy, he conciliated the sympathy of Great Britain and the active assistance of Napoleon. The intervention of Sardinia in the Crimean War gave to her a place in Europe and rendered practically certain the war of Italian liberation. There were other consequences of the war slightly more remote but not less significant. The alienation of the Willem allies was the most obvious. That development was responsible for many things. For a war scare which produced the volunteer movement, for the suspicion with which England regarded Napoleon's intervention in the affairs of Italy, for the impotence of the Western powers in the face of Bismarck's attack upon the Danish duchies, and thus, more remotely, for the overthrow of Austrian power in Germany and the consequent war between Germany and France. We must now turn to the effect of the Crimean War upon the domestic politics of England. In Parliament there was almost complete legislative stagnation, the interest alike of the government and of the people was naturally and properly concentrated upon the prosecution of the war. Other things could wait, the war could not. There was, however, one department of domestic administration upon which the war powerfully reacted. The exchequer had to bear an unusual strain, and the fulfillment of Gladstone's elaborate schemes was hopelessly impeded but the author of the budget of 1853 was jealous of any infringement of its main principles, and he was right to be, for the results of his scheme were eminently successful. Customs, notwithstanding remissions amounting to £1,483,000, produced over £300,000 in excess of the previous year, and excise produced about £370,000 more. In the budget of 1854, therefore, he urged the House to adhere to the principles laid down in the previous year. The war expenditure he estimated at £8,100,000, and this he proposed to raise by doubling the income tax from 7 pence to 14 pence, by raising the malt duty and the duties on Scotch and Irish spirits, and by a new scale of duties on sugar, adapted to a fresh and better classification. To borrowing for war purposes he was, both on moral and economic grounds, sternly opposed. The expenses of a war, he characteristically said, are a check which it has pleased the Almighty to impose upon the ambition and the lust of conquest that are inherent in so many nations the necessity of meeting from year to year the expenditure which war entails is a salutary and a wholesome check. Nevertheless, he was compelled to issue exchequer bills for £1,750,000, besides exchequer bonds to the amount of £6 million in anticipation of revenue. Sir George Cornwall Lewis, who succeeded Gladstone, found himself unable to live up to this standard of financial virtue and contracted a loan of £16 million at £3.8 shillings, sixpence per cent. But even this was insufficient to meet the estimated deficiency of £23 million. Sir George therefore proposed to issue £3 million of exchequer bills to raise the sugar duties from 12 shillings to 15 shillings per hundred weight the duty on coffee from threepence to fourpence, and then on tea from one shilling sixpence to one shilling ninepence per pound. 
he also put an extra tuppence on the income tax and further increased the duties on spirits indirect taxation would thus yield an additional three million three hundred thousand pounds and the income tax an extra two million pounds on august second he had to take power to issue four million pounds additional exchequer bills to provide for supplementary estimates a loan of one million pounds to the sardinian government was readily agreed to but the guarantee of a loan of five million pounds for the turks was carried only by a majority of three the provision made for the war ample as it seemed proved insufficient the additional taxes yielded less than the estimate and in february eighteen fifty six the chancellor of the exchequer had to raise an additional loan of five million pounds this was raised in three per cent consuls at ninety a further loan of five million pounds was contracted in may to meet the estimated deficit in the accounts for eighteen fifty six and eighteen fifty seven the total addition to the national debt funded and unfunded amounted to forty two million pounds nearly as much was raised by increased taxation the whole cost of the war therefore was estimated by lewis at seventy seven million five hundred and eighty eight thousand seven hundred and eleven pounds how far it is economically wise to pay for war out of income how far it is legitimate to pass on a large part of the burden to posterity whether loans if raised at all should be issued in stock of high or low denomination whether it is better to pay a relatively high rate of interest or to keep the rate nominally low at the expense of the increased capital liabilities these are questions which have exercised financial experts for the last two hundred years to them they must be left one reflection may be permitted however much the policy of the crimean war may be approved it is impossible not to deplore its financial results the well-laid schemes of gladstone were hopelessly frustrated and an impetus was given to extravagant expenditure which has never since been arrested the sequelae of the crimean war are discernible in directions far removed from domestic finance even after the signature of peace there were some awkward corners to be turned there were difficulties in regard to the delimitation of the new russian frontier in bessarabia and more still about serpent's island at the mouth of the danube the noticeable point in regard to both is that france steadily supported the russian view as against that of lord palmerston the latter did not hesitate to charge russia with deliberate bad faith in the execution of the treaty and to accuse france of sustaining the former's baseless pretensions the attitude thus adopted by france did not predispose the british minister to regard with favour the interesting suggestion put forward by the french that northern africa should be partitioned between england france and sardinia according to this plan france was to have morocco and england was to occupy egypt and control the proposed canal through the isthmus of suez on the moral aspect of the question palmerston was very explicit the alliance of england and france he wrote has derived its strength not merely from the military and naval power of the two states but from the force of the moral principle upon which that union has been founded how then could we combine to become unprovoked aggressors to imitate in africa the partition of poland by the conquest of morocco for france of tunis and some other state for sardinia and of egypt for england moreover we do not want egypt any more when offered to us by napoleon than when offered by the czar nicholas we want to trade with egypt and to travel through egypt but we do not want the burden of governing egypt for once lord palmerston spoke the language of the manchester school it was inspired largely by increasing mistrust of napoleon the fact is that in our alliance with france we are riding a runaway horse and must always be on our guard the danger is and always has been that france and russia should unite to carry into effect some great scheme of mutual ambition 
in the persian war of eighteen fifty six and eighteen fifty seven we may discern another of the sequelae of the russian war for many years past the english rulers of india had watched with alarm the stealthy advance of russia in central asia and particularly the growth of her influence in persia in eighteen thirty seven the shah of persia attacked herat the strong city commanding the route through which an army must advance toward the invasion of india on the northwest russian diplomatists inspired the move and russian officers accompanied the shah herat was defended on behalf of its prince kamran by major pottinger an english officer the defence was skilful and stubborn and on the appearance of an english squadron in the persian gulf and the withdrawal of the english envoy from tehran the shah abandoned the siege and the gate of india was saved persia did not forget the disappointment of her hopes nor forgive the power by whom they had been thwarted in eighteen fifty one the suspicions of the english government were again aroused and in eighteen fifty three the shah bound himself by a convention not to occupy herat unless it was threatened by a foreign army both england and persia in fact agreed to respect and as far as possible to maintain the independence of herat the war between england and russia ensued and in december of eighteen fifty five the persian government declared that herat was threatened by dost mohammed amir of afghanistan and once more advanced into the territory of herat and laid siege to the city mr murray the british minister at tehran quitted the embassy the persian government refused to withdraw from herat and on november first eighteen fifty six the indian government declared war a fleet was sent to the persian gulf bushir was captured on december tenth a british force of five thousand men was dispatched from bombay under the command of sir james outram and general havelock in february eighteen fifty seven there were two decisive victories and on march fourth eighteen fifty seven a treaty of peace was signed in paris persia renounced all claim over herat or any part of afghanistan and agreed to refer any differences which might arise to the good offices of the british government the british people were disposed to regard lightly the persian war palmerston on the contrary fully realized its significance we are beginning he wrote to repel the first opening of trenches against india by russia before peace was signed with persia we were already involved once more in hostilities with china the dispute arose in the familiar fashion under existing treaties british vessels in chinese waters were subject only to the jurisdiction of our own consuls the arrow a lorcha or coasting schooner was sailing rightly or wrongly under the british flag the crew were chinamen and while the lorcha lay in the canton river she was boarded from a chinese warship and the crew was carried off on a charge of piracy the british consul demanded their extradition and sir james bowring the governor of hong kong supported him the chinese authorities refused reparation and sir michael seymour with the british fleet proceeded to capture some of the forts on the canton river bowring now seized the opportunity to demand the admission of foreigners to canton under the terms hitherto neglected of the treaty of nanking eighteen forty two the chinese made reprisals according to their wont burnt down foreign factories massacred european sailors and set a price upon the heads of the english and french dogs things became so serious that early in eighteen fifty seven troops were dispatched from england and lord elgin was sent out as plenipotentiary the troops were diverted as a later chapter will disclose to a more important duty but canton was taken in eighteen fifty eight and the english and french fleets were sent up to tianxin to enforce the demands of the western powers not until june of eighteen fifty eight was peace finally concluded china agreed to permit a permanent british embassy at pekin and establish one in london 
to open the Yangtze River and five more ports to foreign trade and to protect the Christian religion. Before the Treaty of Tientsin was signed, Lord Palmerston's government had fallen, though not on their Chinese policy. That policy was not indeed unchallenged in Parliament. In February 1857, Lord Derby moved the Lords to condemn it, but though supported by Lord Lyndhurst, he was defeated by 36 votes. In the Commons, Mr. Cobden moved what was virtually a vote of censure and was supported not only by Gladstone, Graham, and Russell, but by Disraeli. The motion was carried by 16 votes, and the government almost immediately announced their intention to appeal to the country as soon as the necessary financial business could be disposed of. This was rapidly done, and on March 20th, Parliament was dissolved. The issue, as placed before the constituencies by Lord Palmerston, was a simple one. Did he or did he not possess their confidence? The answer which they returned was unequivocal. The fortuitous concourse of Adams, by which the government had been defeated, was scattered. The Cobdenites in particular were smitten hip and thigh. In Manchester, Bright was at the bottom of the poll. Milner Gibson, his colleague, also lost his seat. Fox was defeated at Oldham, Mial at Rochdale, and Cobden himself at Huddersfield. The result was a great personal and political triumph for Palmerston. The country believed that in him they had found a leader at once strong and patriotic. He had stood forth in the tempest of doubt and disaster. In the dark days of the Crimean War, he had carried the war to a successful, if not a triumphant, issue. He had stood firm for his country both against enemies and against allies. He had faithfully supported her agents abroad, Bowring in China and Murray in Persia. Overbearing and high-handed he might be, but never pusillanimous, and the country rewarded him during the remainder of his long life with its unstinted gratitude and confidence. In the new Parliament he found himself with a majority such as no government had in recent years enjoyed. Footnote. His majority was 85. End footnote. A strong hand was verily needed at the helm. One storm had been successfully encountered. Another of far greater severity was brewing. Before midsummer it burst. About the middle of June the news reached England that the Sepoy army had mutinied in India and that thousands of English lives, women's and children's no less than men's, were at the mercy of a pitiless and treacherous foe. End of section 26《Section 27 of England Since Waterloo》by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 14. Growth of the British Power in India, 1740 to 1856, Part 1. Great Britain had barely emerged from the strain and stress of the Crimean War, before she was called to confront still graver issues raised by a military revolt in India. The two events were not wholly unconnected, but neither exaggerated rumor as to British reverses in the Crimea, nor any other single cause accounts for the outbreak of the mutiny. The causes were in part immediate, almost accidental, in part they were more general and remote. The latter cannot be understood without some reference to the historical development of British power in India. This would seem, therefore, to be the appropriate occasion for a brief but continuous sketch of a subject which has up to the present been deliberately ignored. The English made their first appearance in India in the 17th century simply as traders, members of a company incorporated under a royal charter by Queen Elizabeth in 1600. They were not, by any means, the first representatives of the merchants of Western Europe. For a full century before Englishmen set foot in India, the Portuguese had ruled a great empire and carried on a large commerce in the East. 
after the absorption of Portugal into Spain in 1580, the Portuguese power in India began to wane rapidly, and to the supremacy of the Portuguese there succeeded that of the Dutch. The Dutch established their great East India Company in 1602. They laid the foundations of Batavia in Java, henceforth the seat of their government in the East. In 1619 and in 1651 they made good the line of communications by occupying the Cape of Good Hope. The Dutch concentrated their attention for the most part upon the rich islands of the eastern archipelago. Thither the English merchants followed them, but the Dutch were intensely jealous of any interference with their valuable monopoly, and in 1623 the memorable massacre of Amboina drove the English merchants, fortunately for their country, to seek refuge upon the continent of India. There, in the course of the 17th century, they established factories in Madras, Bombay, and Bengal. In 1689, the company decided to take a further, and as it proved, a most momentous step. They deliberately resolved to try and obtain a territorial footing in India, and appointed Sir Josiah Child as Governor-General and Admiral of India. They had, however, to make good their position against European rivals. The Portuguese power was decadent. The Dutch, though established in Chinsura, near Calcutta, were intent, as we have seen, mainly on the islands. Our most serious European rivals, therefore, were the French. The French founded no less than five companies for trade in India between 1604 and 1664. Ten years later, they established their famous settlement at Pondicherry, and later still made secure their communications by the occupation of the Ile de France, 1690, and the Ile de Bourbon, 1720. Before the middle of the 18th century, the representatives of the two great Western powers were locked in a desperate struggle for supremacy in India, thus renewing in the Far East the grim contest they were already waging in Europe and North America. That contest was finally decided in our favor by the Treaty of Paris in 1763. The French were permitted to retain Pondicherry and in Bengal, Chandanagore as trading settlements, but not to maintain any military establishment, and from that day forward they ceased to exercise except for two fitful moments during the wars of the American and the French revolutions, any political influence in India. Victorious over the French, the English company now embarked for good or evil upon the turbid sea of Indian politics. The next half-century witnessed a prolonged and desperate struggle for political supremacy between the English company and various native powers and princes. The first round was decided by Clive on the famous field of Plassey, June 23, 1757, a victory which definitely established English supremacy in Bengal. The second consisted of a series of wars against the great Hindu confederacy of the Marathas. The first war was waged under Warren Hastings from 1779 to 1781. It was brilliantly continued by the brothers Wellesley from 1802 to 1804. But the power of this formidable confederacy was not finally broken until the third and last Maratha War under the Marquis of Hastings from 1817 to 1818. The dominions of the Peshwa of Pune were then annexed to the Bombay Presidency. The Peshawar himself retired on a pension of £80,000 a year to Bithur, near Cawnpore, where he reared an adopted son in the tradition of hatred against the British government. That son, the notorious Nana Sahib, flashed for a sinister moment across the page of Indian history in the mutiny, but with his mysterious disappearance the tale of the Maratha Confederacy dies down into silence. Apart from the Marathas, the most imposing powers in southern India were the Nizam of Hyderabad and Hyder Ali of Mysore. 
the former was the greatest of the mohammedan viceroys of the mughal emperor ruling in the emperor's name over a large hindu population almost from the earliest days the nizams formed a friendly alliance with the english company and they remain to this day the greatest and not the least loyal of the feudatory princes of the british raj Haidar ali of mysore was one of the many mohammedan adventurers who at the dissolution of the mughal empire carved out for themselves great principalities by the power of the sword for more than twenty years Haidar ali and his son tipu maintained a fierce and not unequal contest with the english company and not until eighteen o one was it finally decided in our favour upon the foundations well laid by clive and warren hastings by cornwallis and wellesley a wonderful superstructure was during the course of the next half century erected but the expansion and consolidation of british power was due mainly to the logic of events and was effected in defiance of the declared policy of the directors the latter were frankly alarmed at the additional responsibilities thrust upon them by the enterprises of lord wellesley and governor after governor was sent out with explicit instructions to put a peremptory stop to the progressive policy of his predecessor not one of them left india without having added substantially to the responsibilities he inherited lord minto between eighteen o seven and eighteen thirteen for example straightly charged to extricate the company from political embarrassments and honestly intending to do so was the first of the british rulers of india to open diplomatic relations with neighbouring states nor were his actual annexations though small in extent politically insignificant for more than a century the mauritius had been the principal connecting link between france and the east in eighteen ten it was captured and added to our chain java which france had taken from the dutch was acquired in eighteen eleven and in eighteen fourteen cape colony which for one hundred and fifty years had served the dutch voyagers as a halfway house to india was finally and appropriately transferred to the power which had succeeded to their supremacy in the east but not for his annexations was minto's rule memorable in eighteen o nine he concluded a treaty with ranjit singh the famous ruler who had lately welded the religious bond of the trans sutlej sikhs into a powerful confederacy and had erected a great power in the punjab that treaty secured the company against possible dangers from the northwest a second embassy was dispatched to the court of the amir of afghanistan at kabul and a third to the court of persia at tehran these missions it is interesting to remember were inspired primarily by mistrust not of russia but of france napoleon foiled in his scheme for the invasion of england had come to terms with the czar alexander at tilsit and was now contemplating an attack upon the northwest frontier of india his attention was fortunately diverted by the outbreak of the peninsular war but the fact that he seriously entertained the design is not devoid of significance lord minto retired in eighteen thirteen and to him there succeeded lord moira better known by his later title of marquis of hastings like his predecessor he went out to india with a strong prejudice against the aggressive policy of lord wellesley no sooner had he grasped the true position of affairs on the spot than he declared that our object in india ought to be to render the british government paramount in effect if not declaredly so to hold the other states as vassals though not in name and to oblige them in return for our guarantee and protection to perform the two great feudatory duties of supporting our rule with all their forces and submitting their mutual differences to our arbitration during his long reign he went far towards giving effect to the principles thus enunciated his first war was forced upon him by the restlessness and encroachments of the highlanders of india the gurkhas of nepal 
the gurkhas had long been a terror to all their neighbours in the himalayan fastnesses to the repeated remonstrances and warnings of sir george barlow and lord minto they had paid no heed and in eighteen fourteen hastings was compelled to declare war the gurkhas some of the best fighters among the hill tribes offered an obstinate resistance but after two years hard fighting the brilliant campaign of general achterlony enabled hastings to dictate the terms of peace of sigali december eighteen sixteen that treaty has defined the relations of nepal to the british raj from that day to this the gurkhas having made a splendid fight frankly accept defeat and have since contributed some of the most valuable recruits to our indian army the company acquired a long strip of the lower himalayas with most of the adjacent forest lands extending from the present western frontier of the nepal state northwestward as far as the sutledge river this acquisition though not of great extent has proved an immense boon to british administration in india for within it are to be found the health-giving stations of shimla Usuri, and nanital for the rest the results of the expedition are thus summarized by sir alfred lyell all the hill country that now overhangs rohilkund and the northwest provinces up to the jumna river fell into our hands the anglo-indian frontier was carried up to and beyond the watershed of the highest mountains separating india from tibet or from cathay and the english dominion thus became coterminous for the first time with the chinese empire whose government has ever since observed our proceedings with marked and intelligible solicitude having dealt with the gurkhas hastings next turned his attention to the pacification of central india life and property had long been rendered utterly insecure by the plundering raids of bands of freebooters known as pindaris these human jackals represented the debris of the mughal empire the broken men who had not been incorporated by the mohammedan or the hindu powers which sprang out of the ruins no orderly administrator could tolerate the continued existence of a social pest of this character and hastings determined by one swift and strong blow to annihilate their power the pindaris enjoyed the sympathy if not the avowed support of most of the mahratta chiefs to whose trade they had succeeded to proceed against them with anything less than overwhelming force would therefore have been simply to court disaster hastings accordingly collected a magnificent army of one hundred and twenty thousand men and literally hunted down and cut to pieces these formidable marauders this done he proceeded to deal a final blow at the marathas themselves a confederacy formed between the peshwa of Pune, holkar of indore and the rajah of nagpur was defeated in detail with results already recorded thus did lord hastings carry to a successful conclusion the work begun by lord wellesley and established the british raj as the power paramount in india on the resignation of lord hastings in eighteen twenty two the governor-generalship was accepted by mr canning but the death of lord castlereagh detained that statesman in england and deprived both india and canning of an opportunity which would probably have been unique in default of canning lord amherst was sent out his rule from eighteen twenty three to eighteen twenty eight is memorable for the first burmese war and the capture of the great fortress of Bharatapur. the eastern frontiers of bengal had for some time been threatened by the advance of the kingdom of burma the intermediate tribes who had been taken under british protection were frequently annoyed by their encroachments and in eighteen twenty four amherst was forced to declare war the war is notable for two reasons it afforded in the first place a clear premonition of the mutiny the bengal sepoys were gravely disturbed by the prospect of an oversea expedition they refused to cross the black water 
the forty seventh native infantry broke into open mutiny at barakpur and had to be ruthlessly shot down the war itself lasted two years and cost us twenty thousand lives and fourteen million pounds sterling the main expedition penetrated to ava and in eighteen twenty six amherst dictated the peace of yandabu the king of burma was obliged to cede the maritime provinces of arakan and tenasserim and to recognize the english protectorate over upper assam kachar and manipur thus the war is memorable in the second place by reason of the fact that it brought for the first time a non-indian people within the jurisdiction of the indian empire in the year following the conclusion of the burmese war lord combermere the stapleton cotton of the peninsular war was dispatched in command of an expedition against the jat state of Bharatpur. the storming of the capital city not only crowned a successful campaign but he faced the bad impression created by lord lake's failure in a similar enterprise in eighteen o five the idea had gained credence that the city was impregnable even against british arms combermere's timely victory served therefore to dissipate a notion which had threatened to become a political danger amherst's aggressive policy though not lacking the justification of success did not approve itself to his masters at home the directors were alarmed by rapidly increasing expenditure the board of control were aghast at accumulating responsibility consequently amherst was recalled in eighteen twenty seven and there was appointed to succeed him a man who could be trusted to give a new turn to british policy in india twenty years before lord william bentinck had been governor of madras and had been recalled for lack of vigour in dealing with a serious mutiny at Bellore in eighteen o six but the son of a former prime minister and the kinsman of the prime minister of the day got a second chance in eighteen twenty eight and used it to the full for close on a century the company's territories in india had expanded with astonishing rapidity and now as a result of almost continuous war and almost continuous annexation john company had become the lord paramount in hindustan two results only could justify this position firstly the suppression of the anarchy which prevailed on the dissolution of the mughal empire and the restoration of order and stable government to miserably distracted peoples and secondly the amelioration of the social and economic condition of our new subjects in india the first task was to a large extent achieved under the rule of lord wellesley and lord hastings order was evolved out of chaos and legal rule was substituted for lawless violence the second and even more difficult task was that to which lord william bentinck set his hand with his name no great extension of territory is associated he was compelled in eighteen thirty to place mysore under british administration and protection and in eighteen thirty four he annexed the little territory of Korg, in consequence of the flagrant tyranny of the rajah and in consideration of the unanimous wish of the people but not by these things is the rule of bentinck remembered in eighteen thirty three an important change took place in the constitutional position of the company its charter was renewed by parliament for another twenty years but only on condition that it abandoned finally its commercial monopoly and ceased to carry on trade at all at the same time there was added to the governor-general's council a fourth legal member who was not to be the servant of the company and the governor-general of bengal was transformed into the governor-general of india with power to legislate in council for the whole of british india a commission was also appointed to revise and codify the law the first legal member of council and the first president of the law commission was macaulay at last therefore the old confusion deplored as long ago as seventeen seventy six by adam smith was finally resolved 
the company ceased to be a merchant and was henceforward only a sovereign but its sovereignty had long been shared with the ministry of the day in england in india itself the constitutional position of the company had been first defined by clive who established in seventeen sixty five the dual system under this arrangement the company took over in return for a large annual tribute to the emperor and the nawab of Murshidabad, the diwani or whole fiscal administration of bengal bihar and orissa the system did not work and was terminated by warren hastings his rule witnessed also the beginnings of parliamentary interference with the company's affairs in india the regulating act of seventeen seventy three provided for the appointment of a governor-general and council for bengal with loose powers of control over the other provinces it established a high court of justice a first step toward the differentiation of the judicature and executive and it stipulated that the british ministry should be regularly supplied with information concerning the company's correspondence with india the daring defiance with which hastings treated both directors and ministers combined with the inherent vices of the system itself to bring this provisional arrangement to an end pitt's india act of seventeen eighty four established a dual control it left the affairs of the company untouched as regards trade but it virtually transferred political responsibility to a board of control consisting of six commissioners all of whom were to be privy councillors and among whom was always to be the chancellor of the exchequer and one of the principal secretaries of state the president of this board almost invariably a cabinet minister was virtually though not until eighteen fifty eight in name a secretary of state for india and controlled indian administration with the assistance of a secret committee of three directors through this secret committee the orders of the board were transmitted to india the system thus established was frankly a compromise but it worked well enough until the mutiny when john company was abolished and the administration of india was finally transferred to the crown bentinck proved himself in many directions an intrepid and effective reformer he extricated the finances from the chaos in which they had been left by amherst he cut down the allowances of the military and civil servants of the company he issued regulations for a new settlement of the revenue of the northwest provinces he entirely reorganized the provincial judicature he abolished flogging in the native army he provided for the admission of natives to many offices in the company's service and he rendered a real service to social order by the suppression of the thugs a caste of hereditary assassins above all with exemplary courage he grappled with the difficult problem of sati in the year eighteen seventeen no fewer than seven hundred widows many of them mere children had according to the ancient custom been sacrificed in bengal alone on the funeral pyres of their husbands vainly had the great mughal emperor akbar attempted to abolish this cruel custom it had acquired the sanctity of a religious rite and it needed no ordinary resolution to interfere with it bentinck however was determined and in spite of opposition from europeans and natives alike he carried a resolution in council by which all who abetted sati were declared guilty of culpable homicide bentinck returned to england in eighteen thirty five leaving behind him in india the memory of a wise upright and paternal administration macaulay's well-known inscription on his statue in calcutta has the rare merit of literal accuracy he abolished cruel rights he effaced humiliating distinctions he gave liberty to the expression of public opinion his constant study was to elevate the intellectual and moral character of the nations committed to his charge as to the wisdom of some of bentinck's reforms more particularly that for the admission of natives to office opinions may possibly differ but it cannot be gainsaid that he gave to india a much-needed interval of repose 
that repose was rudely and quickly broken by his successor for some months after bentinck's resignation the reins of power were held by sir charles afterwards lord metcalfe as senior member of council well had it been had he retained them peel appointed lord Hatesbury to the office but on returning to power in april of eighteen thirty five the whigs cancelled Hatesbury's appointment and sent out to india lord auckland auckland had served as first lord of the admiralty under lord grey and had twice filled the office under melbourne he might be presumed therefore to know thoroughly the mind of the government he certainly knew the mind of lord palmerston and lord palmerston's mind was filled with mistrust of the eastern policy of russia he had good reason by the treaty of unkiar skelesi eighteen thirty three russia had lately converted the black sea into a russian lake and had virtually established herself as protector and patron of the port she had lately won a diplomatic victory over england at tehran and had thwarted an english scheme for the establishment of a new euphrates route to india with all these things and with palmerston's views on them lord auckland was familiar consequently one of his first acts after arriving in india was to dispatch captain alexander burns on a mission to kabul this mission was the prologue of a long series of the grimmest tragedies in the whole drama of indian politics a brilliant afghan adventurer dost mohammed had by this time made himself master of the fierce tribes of afghanistan and ruled them with an iron hand as amir of kabul the northwestern frontier of british india rested on the sutledge the amirs of sindh guarded the mouths of the indus while the sikhs in the punjab stood watch over the passes of the himalayas the supreme ambition of dost mohammed was the recovery of peshawar at one time the eastern outpost of the afghan empire but now in the strong hands of Ranjit Singh. With Ranjit Singh we had no quarrel. He had faithfully observed the treaty concluded by Lord Minto in 1809, and a strong power in the Punjab was the best guarantee we could possess against the hostile incursions from the northwest. Auckland's concern was not, therefore, for Peshawar, but for Herat, which at the moment was seriously threatened by Persia. Dost Mohammed, on his part, was quite willing that Herat should fall to Persia, provided that Persia would help him to the recovery of Peshawar. Such was the complicated situation by which Lord Auckland was confronted. Nor was it simplified by Burns's mission, for Burns found that he was not the only European diplomatist at Kabul. A Russian envoy, Vikovich, was there also and the advice of Vikovich was far more palatable to the amir than that of burns let persia have herat and persia will help you to your eagerly desired revenge upon the sikhs and the recovery of peshawar that for persia a suspicious eye might have read russia mattered little to dost mohammed what could burns offer against this nothing but the platonic friendship and half-hearted diplomatic support of england vikovich held all the cards but burns had pluck and skill and might have won had he been supported from calcutta auckland however haunted by the spectre of russia at the gates of herat and a russian pawn in possession of peshawar suddenly made an entirely new move he decided to withdraw burns from kabul and to replace dost mohammed on the throne of afghanistan by a puppet of his own the puppet selected was shah shuja an aged grandson of ahmad shah the founder of the durrani dynasty in afghanistan shah shuja had been expelled from the throne by dost mohammed and was now living under british protection at ludhiana his majesty shuja al-mulk will enter afghanistan surrounded by his own troops and will be supported against foreign interference and factious opposition by a british army 
such was the pretty make-believe solemnly put forward in auckland's manifesto to facilitate this legitimist restoration a treaty was concluded between the british government shah shuja and ranjit singh the latter was to be confirmed in possession of the provinces which his sword had wrested from afghanistan the integrity of herat was to be respected and shah shuja in return for a sum to be fixed by the british government was to relinquish all claim to tribute from the amirs of sind and to guarantee their independence july eighteen thirty eight ranjit singh despite the advantages secured to him by this alliance wisely refused to allow the passage of a british army through the punjab and the advance therefore had to be made through sind the amirs were not less reluctant than ranjit singh but they were far less powerful and though they imposed every obstacle they dared a magnificent army started in december of eighteen thirty eight unfortunately for auckland one of his excuses for the invasion had already evaporated for on october ninth the persians inconsiderately raised the siege of herat and agreed to molest it no more but he was pledged to the restoration of a legitimate sovereign to the throne of his immediate ancestors and it seemed too late to draw back the army consequently went on its way marched through sind and thence by way of the bolan pass to Quetta, and on from there to kandahar kandahar opened its gates and there shah shuja was enthroned may eighth eighteen thirty nine between kandahar and kabul lay the strong fortress of ghazni ghazni was stormed in july and the road lay open to kabul on the approach of the british army dost mohammed fled and in august shah shuja was escorted in triumph into the balahisar at kabul end of section twenty seven Section twenty eight of England since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter fourteen Growth of the British Power in India, seventeen forty to eighteen fifty six. Part two By the Home Government, the Afghan expedition was regarded as magnificent alike in conception in execution and in results by taking the afghans under our control wrote palmerston and in garrisoning if necessary herat we shall regain our ascendancy in persia british security in persia gives security on the eastward to turkey and tends to make the sultan more independent and to place the dardanelles more securely out of the grasp of nicholas no words could reveal more clearly the true inwardness of the policy by which auckland and the british cabinet were conjointly responsible in afghanistan it soon became clear that the legitimate sovereign could count upon the loyalty of his subjects only so long as he was protected by british bayonets and for two years we remained in military occupation of the country about kabul and kandahar at length however it was decided to withdraw a portion of the army of occupation arrangements for the withdrawal were on the point of completion when the anger of the afghans long pent up suddenly burst forth and sir alexander burns just appointed to succeed sir william macnaughton as political officer was assassinated in kabul november second eighteen forty one general elphinstone a very aged officer was in command of the british troops and owing to his inexplicable apathy a riot was suffered to grow into an insurrection the insurrection carried all before it and still elphinstone did little or nothing to check it on the contrary he determined to evacuate the country akbar khan the eldest son of dost mohammed appeared at kabul at the end of november and with him was concluded on december eleventh a treaty by the terms of which the afghans undertook to speed the departure of the british garrison by furnishing provision and transport 
still there was delay the afghans were slow in furnishing supplies and macnaughton occupied the interval by intrigues with rival chieftains invited to confer with akbar khan he walked into a trap and was murdered by akbar's own hand december twenty third eighteen forty one no attempt was made to avenge him elphinstone's one anxiety was to get out of the country and a further treaty on terms perhaps the most humiliating ever imposed upon a british general was concluded on january first eighteen forty two on the sixth the retreat actually began through the mountainous defiles between kabul and jalalabad the force made its way in the depth of winter and harassed perpetually by the attacks of the fanatical tribesmen of the hills after two or three days the women and children were confided to the hands of akbar khan and later on the aged and imbecile general in the hope of saving the remnant of his force surrendered himself and his staff as hostages each fresh humiliation was in vain out of the forty five hundred fighting men and twelve thousand camp followers only one man dr bryden reached jalalabad in safety a few prisoners were protected by akbar khan but the rest perished miserably having succumbed to the rigours of the march or been cut to pieces by the afghan tribesmen at jalalabad sir robert sale and his brigade had for two months been holding out general knott was holding kandahar both generals were ordered to withdraw the garrisons and both to the honour of the british name refused meanwhile in india some efforts were made to retrieve the disaster an attempt under brigadier wild to force the kaibar pass failed but in february general pollock reached peshawar to take over the command not however until april was he in a position to take the field sale and broadfoot were still holding out at jalalabad and had actually beaten off akbar khan in a pitched battle when on april sixteenth they were relieved by pollock what was to be the next step were the garrisons to be summarily withdrawn from kandahar and jalalabad or was some retribution to be exacted from the afghans the decision was no longer in lord auckland's hands the whig government had fallen in eighteen forty one and one of peel's first acts was to send out lord ellenborough to supersede him eighteen forty two for the policy which had been inaugurated so rashly and had failed so miserably the whig cabinet was not less responsible than auckland a change of government in india was under the circumstances inevitable but in his choice of a successor to auckland peel showed less than his usual discernment a great orator and a skilled administrator ellenborough was nevertheless lacking in moral courage and above all was self-conscious and bombastic in regard to afghanistan he threw the real responsibility on to the generals in command they were ordered to withdraw but by way of kabul pollock and sale fought their way from jalalabad not from kandahar and on september sixteenth they met at kabul the great bazaar and the palace of the city were blown up the prisoners including lady sale were recovered and in october eighteen forty two the british force withdrew from afghanistan our miserable puppet shah shuja was murdered in eighteen forty three and dost mohammed released from india was permitted to reseat himself upon the throne that nothing might be wanting in this story of folly and humiliation lord ellenborough thought fit to add a touch of ridicule and melodrama general knott had been ordered to bring back with him as a trophy the gates of sumnath from the tomb of the sultan mahmud at ghazni these gates were reputed to have been carried away from a great temple in india by mahmud in the eleventh century as a matter of fact they were a modern forgery and their restoration with elaborate ritual and a vainglorious proclamation added an element of farce to the grim tragedy so recently enacted 
Thirty years later it was revived, and every scene of the drama was with singular precision repeated on the same stage. The results of the first Afghan war did not end with the withdrawal of the army, nor with Lord Ellenborough's famous proclamation. Two wars followed in the logic of history. The first was with the Amirs of Sindh. Their independence had virtually disappeared with the passage of the British army through their territory in 1839. Throughout the subsequent period, we had been obliged to maintain our line of communications by garrisoning the island of Bukur, which commands the passage of the Indus on the road to the Bolan Pass and Karachi. When the Afghan war was over, it seemed to Lord Ellenborough inconvenient to surrender these places. A pretext was soon found. Treaties imposed upon the emirs had been indifferently respected. Further demands were made upon them, and in 1843 Major Utram, our political agent at Hyderabad, was attacked in the residency. He held it gallantly with 100 men against 8,000, and safely withdrew his little garrison. Sir Charles Napier, with 3,000 troops, then flung himself upon an army of more than 20,000 Sindhis and Baluchis at Miani, and achieved one of the most brilliant victories in the history of British arms in India. Three days later, February 20th, he entered Hyderabad, and another victory in the neighborhood of the capital brought the little campaign to a conclusion. Its inevitable consequence was the annexation of Sindh. The territory of the Amirs, though not extensive, was of first-rate strategical importance, its annexation gave us the command of the lower Indus Valley and of the estuary of that river. It completed our circuit of the sea coast of Hindustan, and it gave Napier the opportunity of substituting for a cruel and grasping government the unappreciated blessings of order and prosperity. Before the year was out, Ellenborough had begun and successfully ended an expedition against the Maratha state of Gwalior. Though left in the hands of Sindhya, Gwalior was under British protection. In consequence of domestic broils, the resident found it necessary in 1843 to withdraw. An army under Sir Hugh Gough was accordingly dispatched to maintain order. The Marathas opposed him at Maharajpur when he fought and won an important victory. General Grey won a victory on the same day at Paniar, and peace was promptly restored. The Maratha army was largely reduced, and a British force maintained at the expense of Gwalior was substituted for it. The Gwalior campaign had two important results. It dissipated the danger of a possible coalition between the Marathas and the Sikhs against the British Raj, and it served to bring Ellenborough's reign to an end. His feverish activity alarmed both the directors and the cabinet, and in 1844 he was superseded by Sir Henry Harding. Harding, though a veteran soldier, was sent out to India with a message of peace and with definite instructions to pursue a policy of retrenchment. Before he had been a year in India, he found himself, with an irony characteristic of British rule in India, involved in one of the most formidable wars of the century. The Sikhs were not a distinct racial unit, but a religious sect, the disciples of a prophet of the 15th century. On the breakup of the Mughal Empire, they, like the Marathas, emerged as a great territorial power. In the person of Ranjit Singh, 1780-1839, they produced a great statesman. In his hands, the loose confederation of the Sikhs were transformed into a compact nation, resting on the basis of an army perfectly disciplined and organized by some of Napoleon's exiled veterans upon European models. Ranjit Singh, however, recognized the might of the British Raj and remained throughout life faithful to the Treaty of 1809. By that treaty, his activities were restricted to the trans sutlej territory, but he added to his dominions Multan, Kashmir, and Peshwar. The power which he had thus built up in the Punjab was exceedingly formidable. 
but it was subject to the defect common to all oriental principalities its basis was purely personal on his death in eighteen thirty nine confusion quickly ensued and his capital lahore was the theatre of perpetual quarrels intrigues and assassinations the only organized power was that of the army and the army was bent on trying conclusions with the english company ever since the close of the afghan war the british government had been fully alive to the danger threatened by the unsettled state of the punjab and by the fixed ambition of the army but they were determined to give the sikhs no ground for offence harding indeed is accused by some critics of having gone too far in this direction as to have left the frontier inadequately guarded in december eighteen forty five the attack was delivered on the eleventh the sikh army sixty thousand strong with one hundred and fifty guns crossed the sutlej near farazpur the next few weeks witnessed some of the heaviest fighting in the history of british india sir hugh gough hurried up with ten thousand men and on december eighteenth inflicted a crushing defeat on the sikhs at mudki then picking up the garrison under sir john littler at farazpur he attacked the fortified camp of the invaders at firaz shah december twenty first and twenty second the sikhs were far superior in numbers and guns and fought with the utmost determination but again gough was victorious those victories were bought at a high price and wounded and killed sale and broadfoot being among the latter but they were decisive india was saved from invasion and the sikhs were compelled to recross the sutlej not however for long in the first month of the new year eighteen forty six they were back again moving on ludhiana sir harry smith was accordingly dispatched to support the little garrison with which brigadier godby held that post sir harry relieved the garrison and then on january twenty eighth he inflicted a crushing defeat on the sikhs at alawal meanwhile gough was watching the main body of the enemy who had established themselves in a strongly fortified camp at sobraon guarding a bridge across the sutlej sir harry smith rejoined the commander-in-chief on february tenth and the two generals with their combined armies carried the camp by storm and drove the enemy with immense loss across the sutlej this was the crowning and conclusive victory of sobraon on the evening of the battle the advance on lahore began on february twentieth the army was outside the walls of the capital and sir henry harding dictated the terms of a peace which was concluded at lahore on march ninth the sikhs agreed to cede the territory which lies between the sutlej and the bees rivers to cut down their army to limits prescribed by us to surrender all the guns used against us to pay an indemnity and receive a british garrison for eight years there was to be no annexation of the punjab dhulip singh a reputed son of ranjit was recognized as raja but the administration of the country was virtually committed to major henry lawrence who was to remain as british resident at lahore sir hugh gough and sir henry harding were rewarded with peerages and in eighteen forty eight harding handed over the reins to his successor with the cheering assurance that so far as human foresight could predict it would not be necessary to fire a gun in india for seven years to come that successor was perhaps the greatest ruler ever given by great britain to india during the eight years of lord dalhousie's reign modern india came into being and to preside over such a transformation the new governor-general was preeminently well fitted politically he was peel's disciple he had served in his government as president of the board of trade and had commended his fiscal reforms to the house of lords he believed that in india he had a fair field for administrative reform others believed it too the youngest ruler who has assumed the responsibilities of this empire he receives it from his predecessor in a state of tranquillity which has hitherto no parallel in our indian annals 
he arrived at a time when the last obstacle to the complete and apparently the final pacification of india had been removed when the only remaining army which could create alarm had been dissolved and the peace of the country rests upon the firmest and most permanent basis the chiefs whose ambition or hostility have been the source of disquietude to his predecessors have one and all been disarmed nowhere is fate more prone to mock than in india three months after these words were written a tragic outrage at multan had reopened the question as to the future of the punjab and had involved dalhousie in the difficult problems from which he never really emerged till he left india a dying man in eighteen fifty six sir william hunter has summarized dalhousie's work in india under three heads the extension of our external frontier the internal consolidation and unification of our territory and the development of national resources the transformation of the agricultural india of antiquity into the manufacturing and mercantile india of our own day in eighteen forty eight the map of india was divided into two sections one was under the immediate control of the english company the other consisted of the feudatory states in which we exercised a greater or less degree of control but without direct responsibility the device was at best only a convenient makeshift and the results were in some cases deplorable british arms often maintained upon their thrones vicious and tyrannical sovereigns who but for our support would long since have paid the common and appropriate penalty of oriental despotism british residents though powerful to avert external interference were impotent to secure good administration at home on the contrary their presence defended the native prince from the consequences of his misrule no ruler with an instinct for orderly administration could permit such a state of affairs to endure a day longer than was necessitated by the inadequacy of his own resources dalhousie's perception of this fact was largely responsible for the transformation of the map of india under his hand it was the punjab which first demanded his attention lord harding had rigorously curtailed its army and had placed the country under a regency of sikh chiefs controlled by a british resident at lahore the device was not to the liking of the chiefs or people and in april eighteen forty eight the prevailing discontent blazed out two young officers mr vans agnew a civilian and lieutenant anderson were sent to multan to superintend a change in the government of the district and while executing their mission were brutally assassinated their dying appeal for help reached lieutenant herbert edwards stationed eighty miles away upon the indus edwards collected what forces he could and on june eighteenth and july first won two brilliant victories over mulraj the deposed governor of multan but it had already become clear that the local outbreak at multan was developing into a general insurrection of the sikhs the punjab would either have to be abandoned or reconquered edwards appealed for immediate assistance but lord gough refused to take the field with the inadequate force at his command and during the hottest season of the year his caution though much criticised approved itself both to the governor-general and to the authorities at home by november however he was ready to advance from ferazpur with an army of twenty thousand men and on the twenty second a dearly bought victory at Bramnagar enabled him to effect a crossing of the chenab it was an inauspicious beginning and there was worse to come on january thirteenth eighteen forty nine gough was goaded into a rash and premature attack upon the sikh position then ensued the battle of chilianwala which a brilliant pen has described as an evening battle fought by a brave old man in a passion and mourned for by the whole british nation the british loss in killed and wounded reached the terrible toll of two thousand three hundred thirty eight men four of our guns were captured by the sikhs and three standards it was not a defeat but it needs some special pleading to claim it as a victory 
and as soon as the news reached England, there arose a loud clamour for the recall of Lord Gough. Sir Charles Napier was accordingly sent out to supersede him, but before Napier could reach India, Gough won a brilliant victory at Gujarat, February 20th. Multan had surrendered a month earlier, January 22nd, and after Gujarat, General Gilbert chased the Sikhs and their Afghan allies across the plains of the Punjab. At Rawalpindi, the whole of the Sikh army surrendered, March 12th, and the Afghans were hunted into the mountains. Thus was the Second Sikh War brought to a triumphant termination, and the military power of the Sikh Confederacy was forever broken. There could be but one sequel to the war. The half-measures of Lord Harding could not be repeated, and Lord Dalhousie, while deeply sensible of the responsibility he assumed, determined that the Punjab must be annexed to British India. In this step, Harding himself generously and cordially concurred. The young Maharaja Dulip Singh received a pension of £50,000 a year in the titular dignity of Prince. The administration of the newly conquered province was committed to a board consisting of the two Lawrences, Henry and John, and Mr. Mansell acting under the immediate direction of the Governor-General. The Sikh army was disbanded, the Sikh confederacy was broken up, and the whole of the vast territory it had ruled was in a few years reduced to order and subordination by the genius of the Lawrences how completely they gained the respect if not the affection of the sikhs the tale of the mutiny was soon to prove while no words can exaggerate the importance of the bulwark they thus erected on the most vulnerable frontier of british india lord dalhousie's second annexation was the sub-montane track of sikkim in the himalayas due north of bengal relatively small in extent this annexation gave us an important tea-growing district and brought us into direct relations with Tibet. Much more important was the annexation of Pegu, a large tract of Lower Burma. This was the fruit of the Second Burmese War. More important still were the annexations in central India, rendered possible by a rigorous application of the doctrine of lapse. When a Hindu had no lineal heirs, it had long been the custom for him to adopt an heir and bequeath to him not merely his private possessions but his principality as well with the rights of adopted heirs to private inheritances dalhousie had no wish to interfere but he held that the interests of good government required that no rights of political succession should accrue without the sanction of the paramount power this principle dalhousie fearlessly applied in deference to this doctrine, the Maratha Principality of Satara was annexed in 1849, and those of Jhansi and Nagpur in 1853. The last added to British India the great district known as the Central Provinces. The same doctrine is responsible for the less important annexations of Jaitpur, Bhagat, Udaipur, and Budawal. That these annexations were made with the most scrupulous conscientiousness on the part of the Governor General and that the result of them was to substitute good government for bad government is undeniable. But it is not less certain that in the aggregate they tended to create a feeling of unrest among the peoples of India, which was among the contributing causes of the subsequent mutiny. Most significant of all in this respect and most direct in its bearing upon the Sepoy mutiny was the annexation of the Mohammedan kingdom of Oud. In no district of India was the government more notoriously and more heartlessly oppressive. The misrule had been persistent for half a century. Lord Wellesley had foreseen as long ago as 1801 that the paramount power would be compelled to interfere. Thirty years later, Lord William Bentinck, least ambitious and most humane of rulers, had solemnly warned the king that failure to amend his ways could have but one result. Lord Harding, in 1847, definitely limited the period of grace to two years. In 1856, Dalhousie determined to act. It was his solemn conviction that the British government would be guilty in the sight of God and man 
if it were any longer to aid in sustaining by its countenance an administration fraught with suffering to millions but for that countenance the kings would long since have paid the penalty for persistent oppression and misrule and dalhousie felt that the responsibility thus incurred by the british government was too heavy to be borne any longer nevertheless he shrank from the final and formal step that the actual administration should be vested in the company seemed to him inevitable but he would have left the king his title rank and ample revenues the directors decreed otherwise and on february thirteenth eighteen fifty six the formal annexation avowed to the dominions of the company was proclaimed on the fallen dynasty no compassion need be wasted they had been repeatedly warned but despite warnings had persisted in their evil ways as for their subjects no one can doubt that in place of a bad government they got a good one but it is none the less true that oud supplied a large proportion of the mutineers of eighteen fifty seven the annexation of oud was the last official act of lord dalhousie but to dwell exclusively upon the change he effected in the map of british india would be to present this administration in false perspective that change was indeed stupendous the british india of eighteen fifty six was between a third and a half larger than that of eighteen forty eight more than that its political centre of gravity had profoundly altered realizing this fact and all that it implied dalhousie promoted a series of consequential changes lower bengal was placed under a lieutenant governor and the governor-general was set free for his wider responsibilities the centre of military gravity was shifted steadily toward the northwest the seat of the supreme government was transferred during the greater part of the year to the himalayan summer resort of shimla and thither in eighteen sixty five the army headquarters followed it to bind together the old british india and the new dalhousie devised a comprehensive scheme of railway construction basing it financially upon the system which he would fain have applied to england in eighteen forty four individuals were to find the capital and the state was to guarantee a minimum rate of interest to the same source india owes the telegraphic system and the halfpenny post a wonderful expansion of trade and the foundations of a national system of education the work actually achieved by dalhousie was stupendous the face of the whole land was transformed and much more than the face of it we are not even yet perhaps in a position to gauge accurately the full effect of the changes which dalhousie initiated we are making wrote sir edwin arnold in eighteen sixty five a people in india where hitherto there have been a hundred tribes but no people there could be no better summary of dalhousie's work whether lord dalhousie was fully conscious of the dangers implicit in his own handiwork is a question which cannot be decided but to suggest that he was wrapped in any false security as a libel upon his powers of perception and prescience no prudent man having any knowledge of eastern affairs would ever venture to predict a prolonged continuance of peace in india these were his parting words to the people of india to his employers at home his warnings were equally candid and more specific he protested strongly against the withdrawal of european troops from india and earnestly warned the government against the dangerously increasing disproportion between english and native troops even for the exigencies of the crimean war india ought not to be depleted of british troops we are perfectly secure he wrote so long as we are strong and are believed to be so between eighteen fifty four and eighteen fifty seven reports were industriously circulated in india that the crimean war had demonstrated to the world the military weakness of great britain in many quarters those reports found ready credence we were believed not to be strong one of the main props of our security was thus rudely shaken and the result was seen in the outbreak of the mutiny End of section 28
Section 29 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 15. The Indian Mutiny, 1856 to 1858, Part 1. In February 1856, Lord Dalhousie handed over the reins of government to his successor. The man selected for this arduous responsibility was Lord Canning, the third son of the great statesman, who had himself in 1822 accepted the office to which his son was now called. A contemporary of Dalhousie's at Christchurch, Lord Canning had, like his predecessor, served his political apprenticeship under Peel. As Postmaster General, he had been a member of the Coalition Cabinet, from 1853 to 1855. From the moment of his arrival in India, he found himself confronted with difficulties. Herat to be defended from the attacks of Persia, Oud to be provided with a regular administration, the native army to be reorganized. But he was hardly seated in the saddle when all other anxieties were thrown into the shade by the outbreak of mutiny among the sepoys of bengal historians are not even now agreed as to the precise scope and nature of the rising of eighteen fifty seven on the one hand it is described as a purely military revolt on the other as an attempt at political revolution if it never actually engulfed india in revolution that was mainly because the revolt was subdued in time for the causes which contributed to the outbreak were not merely military. Mutinies among the native troops were not unknown in India. A serious mutiny had broken out at Valor in 1806, Lahore was the scene of a less serious one in 1849, and many others had, during the last thirty years, been hushed up by the authorities. Footnote. For thirty years past, the Bengal army had been in a state of quasi-mutiny, T. R. Holmes, Indian Mutiny, page 63, and footnote. These facts were known to all the responsible officials in India. They were known also to the native soldiers, to the native princes, and to the people at large. From the latter, nothing that happens in India can be concealed, though their demeanor gives no hint of the knowledge they possess. More particularly were they alive to the fact that in 1857 the native troops outnumbered the British by seven or eight to one. Of the native army, nearly half belonged to Bengal, and of these large numbers were drawn from the province of Oud. The latter, as we have seen, had a special and a recent reason, if not for disaffection, at any rate for unrest. But all sections of the Bengal army were unsettled the unsettlement was due to many causes the extension of the military responsibilities of the indian government the oversea expeditions to burma and persia the attempt to europeanize discipline the diminution of the prestige of the regimental officers the passing of the foreign enlistment act in eighteen fifty six all these things contributed to the sense of impending change so long as the military reputation of england was undimmed this was of no great moment but our prestige had lately waned there were exaggerated rumours of reverses to english arms in the crimea men talked of the success of russia in sustaining the siege of sebastopol against england and france in combination even young men had witnessed the disasters in afghanistan and the questionable victories in the punjab Wars in China and Persia were likely to drain the strength even of a great military power. There was not a bazaar in India in which such matters were not eagerly discussed. It is doubtful, however, whether these things, taken by themselves, would have sufficed to produce a great revolt. Enough has been said already of the significance in this connection of Lord Dalhousie's policy. It is not easy to assign to that policy its precise weight as a factor in the problem. Unquestionably, however, the princes and peoples were alike filled with a sense of uneasiness 
by the rapidity with which Dalhousie had extended the dominions of the English company. Nor was there a vestige of gratitude for the blessings of good government. Oriental conservatism is strongly averse to change, even if it be changed for the better. This is a truth which the British mind finds it almost impossible to grasp, but the neglect of it has more than once contributed to disaster. Never did it contribute more directly than in the Indian mutiny. Still more potent was the conviction which rapidly gained ground that the British government was intent on religious proselytism. The Hindu feared for his caste, the Mohammedan for his creed. Then, as often, there were isolated instances of tactless proselytism on the part of well-intentioned soldiers and civilians, but for the idea that there was any deep-laid plot to effect the conversion of the heathen, there was not, of course, the least foundation. Upon materials thus highly inflammable, a live spark was unfortunately dropped. A new weapon, the Enfield rifle, had lately been substituted in the Indian army for the old brown Bess. It was rumored that the new cartridges were greased with the fat of swine and cows. To load the new rifle, the sepoy would have to bite the cartridge. This meant, for the Hindu, desecration, and for the Mohammedan, contamination. To the former, the cow is sacred. To the latter, the pig is pollution. The worst fears of both were apparently justified. The caste of the one was to be undermined, the creed of the other was derided. Both refused to touch the greased cartridges. Their officers, well knowing their prejudice, assured them that the rumor was baseless and that they might safely use the new cartridges. The assurance did but inflame their terror and resentment. They felt themselves the victims of an accursed conspiracy designed to effect their degradation in this world and their damnation in the next. For the sepoys were better informed than their officers. The story of the greased cartridges was true. With incredible folly and carelessness, the fat of swine and cows had been used in glazing the paper which contained the powder. The officers never suspected it. The men learnt it from the low-caste natives employed in the arsenal. The consequences of the initial blunder, and still worse the subsequent denial of the facts, can easily be imagined. The outbreak of mutiny was due in part to sheer terror, in part to justifiable resentment against the fraud which, as the sepoys imagined, had been practiced upon them by those in authority. Personal influences were also working in the same direction. India was full of men with a grievance against the British government. Dispossessed princes, disappointed heirs, greedy placemen deprived of comfortable jobs. Among these personal influences, the most potent was that of the Nana Sahib, the adopted heir of Baja Rao, the last of the Peshwas. The Peshwa died in 1851, and Dalhousie refused to renew to his adopted heir the pension with which since 1818 the Peshwa had been consoled. Second only to the Nana in malignant influence was Azimullah Khan, a Mohammedan agent employed by the Nana to promote his suit in Europe. Nevertheless, it is the opinion of Lord Roberts that despite the accumulation of causes of discontent, personal and general, there would have been no mutiny had the warnings of Dalhousie received the attention they deserved, had the British element in the Indian army been maintained in due proportion to the native, above all, had the British officers been younger, more alert to observe the signs of disaffection, and more prompt to deal with its manifestations. These manifestations became increasingly frequent in the early months of 1857. On January 24th, General Hersey reported from Dum Dum the existence of an unpleasant feeling, which he ascribed to rumors as to the preparation of the new cartridges. The 19th Native Infantry was stationed at Berhampur, a military station about 100 miles from Calcutta. The 34th was at Barakpur. 
these regiments were honeycombed with disaffection and so quickly did the mutinous temper spread that it was thought desirable to disband the nineteenth on march thirtieth and the thirty fourth on may sixth it was however at meirut that the first serious outbreak occurred eighty-five troopers of the third native cavalry having been tried by a court-martial composed of native officers for refusing to touch their cartridges were sentenced to ten years imprisonment were publicly degraded and marched off to jail on the following day sunday may tenth the whole regiment mutinied broke open the jail released their comrades and twelve hundred other prisoners gutted and burnt the european bungalows and massacred every european man woman and child on the outskirts of the cantonments this done the mutineers made off to delhi general hewitt one of lord robert's generals of seventy was in command at Merut, and neither he nor archdale wilson the brigadier made any effort to pursue the mutineers or to warn the garrison at delhi it is the opinion of lord roberts that there was unaccountable if not culpable want of energy displayed by the meirut authorities on this disastrous occasion but that it would have been futile to pursue the mutineers even had their destination been ascertained and that no action however prompt on the part of the Merut authorities could at this stage have arrested the mutiny but the government of india took a serious view of the conduct of affairs at Merut, and general hewitt was removed from his command Merut is forty miles to the north of delhi on the morning of may eleventh the mutineers reached unopposed the ancient capital of india their arrival was expected the native regiments in delhi joined them the teeming inhabitants of the great city were on their side they dragged forth from his retirement the old mughal emperor and proclaimed the restoration of the mohammedan dynasty to the imperial throne of india already a military revolt had developed into a political revolution delhi thus became the centre of the insurrection the fate of british india depended on its speedy recapture toward this end all energies were bent general anson the commander-in-chief was at shimla when the bad news reached him on may twelfth he collected what forces he could at umballa but found them insufficient for the task of retaking delhi and unequipped either with means of transport or with siege guns he proposed therefore to wait until he could march with fair prospect of success but time was of the essence of the situation lord canning urged the general to immediate action sir john lawrence wrote from the punjab in the same sense he admitted that on military principles the general's plea for delay was unanswerable but political considerations should be paramount pray only reflect he wrote on the whole history of india where have we failed when we acted vigorously where have we succeeded when guided by timid counsels anson yielded arranged that two brigades should march from umballa and having united with one from Merut, should try to carry out their orders and make short work with delhi anson himself started on may twenty fourth but succumbed to cholera at kurnal on the twenty sixth and the command of the field force then devolved upon sir henry barnard meanwhile in the punjab sir john lawrence was straining every nerve for the fulfilment of a twofold task to secure the punjab itself and to provide a force to assist in the recapture of delhi lawrence himself was a tower of strength and was splendidly served by his lieutenants herbert edwards john nicholson and robert montgomery there was no panic but at the same time no misplaced reliance upon the loyalty of native troops those troops were not less mutinous in the punjab than elsewhere but prompt action rendered them impotent for mischief the great arsenal at ferozepur was secured and many of the native regiments were disarmed at mianmir multan and peshawar these measures exhibiting a combination of calm courage and stern repression deeply impressed the sikh population as well as those sepoys who were permitted to retain their arms thus lawrence and his lieutenants saved the punjab 
and in saving the Punjab, succored India. On June twenty second, Nicholson was dispatched in command of a strong force to Delhi, and on August fourteenth, he arrived before the town. By that time, the siege, if siege it may be called, had already been in progress for two months. Barnard, succeeding to the command on May twenty sixth, was joined on June seventh by a brigade from Meerut, and with this and five hundred Gurkhas and a siege train, he marched on Delhi. His total force was now about 3,800 strong. On June 8th, he met the mutineers, 8,000 strong, six miles outside the town, drove them within the walls, and himself took up his position on the famous ridge to the north of the city. By the end of June, the rebel army had swollen to 30,000. The British force, therefore, had its work cut out even to defend the ridge. Barnard succumbed to cholera on July 5th, and on the 17th, General Reed, who had succeeded to the command, was compelled through illness to give way in turn to Archdale Wilson. By the end of August, the little force on the ridge had been increased to 8,000 men fit for service, besides 3,000 men in hospital. No reinforcements could be looked for from the south, and Lawrence told Wilson that he had sent the last man he could spare from the Punjab. It was decided, therefore, to deliver an assault without delay. The breaching batteries opened fire on September 11th, and in the early dawn of September 14th, the assault was delivered. The Kashmir Gate was blown in, and two other breaches were effected. Immediately the ramparts were stormed and taken, but for six days the British troops had to fight every inch of ground within the city. Nicholson, who had led the assault with splendid gallantry, was mortally wounded, but still the troops fought on. The magazine was taken after two days' hard fighting on the 16th, and the imperial palace on the 21st. The old Mughal emperor, who thus fell into our hands, was ultimately sent as a state prisoner to Rangoon, where he died in 1862. His three sons, who had surrendered themselves, were shot down without a trial or any forms of arraignment by Hodson, the intrepid leader of the irregular horse. At last, Delhi was ours. With the recapture of Delhi, the scene of the essentially vital struggle, the curtain falls upon the first act of the drama of the mutiny. But there were two other theatres of revolt where the tragedies enacted were even more grim. Grimmest was that at Kanpur. Kanpur is on the great trunk road between Delhi and Calcutta, 270 miles from the former and 684 from the latter. It contained a great native garrison commanded in 1857 by Sir Hugh Wheeler, a very aged officer. Early in May, Wheeler, anticipating mutiny, hastily fortified some buildings and the British residents took refuge within the rough entrenchments. Near to Kanpur is Bitur, where the Nana Sahib lived in state. The native troops mutinied on June 6th, fled from Kanpur to Bitur, and the Nana, putting himself at their head, was proclaimed Peshwa of the Marathas. The troops demanded to be led to Delhi, but the Nana persuaded them first to exterminate the vermin in Kanpur. Within the entrenchments were 870 non-combatants, and to defend them Wheeler had only 240 European soldiers and six guns. Without were 4,000 rebels led by the treacherous Nana. Unspeakable were the sufferings of the little garrison huddled together under the burning June sun, with scant provisions, little water, and constantly exposed to the enemy's fire. For three weeks they held the enemy at bay, but on June 24th they surrendered on the sworn promise of the Nana, that he would guarantee them safe escort by the Ganges to Allahabad. On the 27th they marched out, a miserable company of 450, fever-stricken, wounded, and starving. Just as they were embarking, the full measure of the Nana's treachery was revealed. A murderous fire was opened upon them. The men were shot down or hacked to pieces before the eyes of their wives and children, for only the survivors of the single boatload which actually got afloat managed to escape. The women and children, some 150 in number, were dragged back and thrust into captivity at Kanpur. 
general havelock hastily collecting a force of one thousand men at benares advanced and defeated the rebels at fatpur on july twelfth and three days later inflicted upon them a second crushing defeat at aung on that same day the nana had every woman and child at cawnpur butchered in cold blood and flung dead or dying into a well with a force of six thousand men the nana then tried to stop the advance of havelock once more but too late to save the wretched captives havelock routed the nana and on july seventeenth the english were again masters of cawnpur havelock blew up the palace and magazines at bitur and leaving Neil to occupy Kanpur, he started for the relief of Lucknow. End of section twenty nine.